Uh, fewer than 3% of all people in most of our countries were using cell phones. But you fast forward to today when almost 100% of people are using cell phones. By the time they're 19 or 20 years old, they will have used the phone for 10 years, and we have no idea what type of risk that's carrying. We've immersed ourselves in an ocean of electromagnetic radiation. It's all around us now. Invisible, we can't see it, but we know it's there. Every time you lift up your mobile phone, you know it's there. It's, it's very, very hard to turn the clock back, or if not impossible to turn the clock back. But we need to be aware of the adverse health effects so that we have the choice of taking precaution against the exposures. At present, the World Health Organization statements regarding this are that it is real. We were not the only cancer cluster around a foam mast. There are many cancer clusters around foam masts. Most of the cancers which will arrive haven't arrived yet. How could we have possibly thought putting microwaves to our brain was safe? We just, we just don't fully understand yet what we're doing. We have an announcement finally on whether cell phones cause cancer. An unknown scientist is about to make a discovery that should have changed everything. His name was Winifred Otto Schumann. On the day in question, he was teaching his students about the physics of electricity. How a sphere within a sphere can create electrical tension and subsequently a frequency. Schumann's class had struggled to understand the subject, so to make it easier, the professor instructed them to imagine the Earth as one sphere and the ionosphere as another. He then asked them to calculate the tension that would exist in between. Having no idea himself, Schumann also began to calculate. Eventually, he arrived at a frequency, a frequency of approximately 10 hertz. As incredible as it seemed to Schumann, our planet had a pulse, a measurable frequency that surrounded life on Earth. Although the professor was proud of his find, he didn't see it as a hugely significant one, especially as it was only published in a small science journal, confined to the back pages under the heading of Schumann Resonance. It would take several years and an incredible twist of fate before the professor would begin to realize the true importance of Schumann resonance. That twist of fate had begun 30 years earlier with another German scientist by the name of Hans Berger. Using an EEG machine he had built himself, Berger had made the first ever recording of electrical frequency transmitted by the human brain. It was initially suggested the wave be named after the man who'd discovered it, but Berger, being a modest man, elected for an alphabetical name, 
and called it the alpha wave. Shortly after Professor Schumann's discovery, one of Hans Berger's colleagues, a man named Dr. Ankermuller, happened to stumble upon a bedraggled copy of a small scientific journal. The exact same small scientific journal that Professor Schumann's discovery had been published in several years before. He read the piece several times, shaking his head in disbelief. He realised instantly the magnitude of what was in front of him. The frequency of the alpha waves, recorded by Hans Berger, were almost identical to Schumann resonance. The frequency of the Earth. Dr. Ankermuller immediately contacted Schumann to convince him to investigate further. Schumann agreed and worked alongside one of his students to refine his discovery. They studied in detail how tension is discharged by lightning in the Earth ionosphere cavity. Eventually, they came up with an exact frequency. The pulse of the Earth, Schumann resonance, was exactly 7.83 Hertz. The discovery was remarkable. Schumann resonance wasn't just similar to the alpha waves of the human brain, it was identical. The brain's frequency which controlled our creativity, our performance, our stress, anxiety and our immune system had somehow tuned in to the frequency of the planet. The pulse of the earth had become the pulse of life itself. The frequency of a wave is measured in hertz. This refers to the number of oscillations the wave makes each second. Frequencies range from a billionth the size of an atom to the length of the universe itself. In theory, frequencies are infinite, so ultimately endless. If this was a coincidence, it was nature's most spectacular. So what did all this mean? It wasn't long before somebody tried to find out. His name was Rutger Weaver, an acclaimed scientist from the Max Planck Institute. In the early 1960s, the professor constructed an underground bunker in order to examine the circadian rhythms of man. The circadian rhythm is the day-night cycle that is engraved into all life. Over a 30-year period, the professor conducted experiments in which student volunteers would spend several weeks at a time living in the bunker, completely shielded from the natural resonances of the earth. In his results, Weaver noted some astonishing findings. He discovered that when Schumann resonance was filtered out of the bunker, the student's physical and mental health would suffer. took students down there. He didn't, he didn't uh, trust to do it with, with ill or old people. He took young students down there because he knew, uh, Weaver, Weaver knew, that, that there would be an effect. So obviously underground you don't have Schumann resonance. You only have the transverse magnetic fields from, from in the earth. So by putting, putting them underground they started having, feeling sick having headaches, their circadian rhythm was completely upset. The interesting thing was, when he just introduced the 7.8 hertz frequency with a magnetic pulse generator, they they, they, that immediately stopped. Weaver would secretly introduce the 7.83 frequency to the bunker via a man-made transmitter. Each time he did so, he noted the ill effects suffered by the volunteers either disappeared or decreased. Their stress, headaches and emotional distress was reduced and their sense of well-being was restored. All by the introduction of Schumann resonance. Weaver's research had revealed an incredible connection between human health and the natural frequency of the planet. And in 2011, 
groundbreaking research suggested something even more impressive, that Schumann residents could be connected to the beginnings of life itself. The breakthrough came at the hands of Luc Montagnier, the Nobel Prize winning scientist who first discovered the HIV virus. The professor was conducting water memory experiments, examining how water could retain a memory of substances that had previously been dissolved in it, when he stumbled upon something that would challenge the very principles of science. All life comes from life. This is a fundamental principle of science and one which has never been violated in any experiment. Life can only exist where life has existed before. And the mechanism for this has always been understood to be a material one, such as egg and sperm or spore and cell division. But Luc Montagnier's experiments have offered a very different hypothesis. The professor showed that DNA sequences, the very building blocks of life, communicate with each other in water by emitting low frequency electromagnetic waves. Even when the DNA was kept in separate test tubes, the professor still recorded electromagnetic communication between them. How sophisticated could this communication be? Well, Luc Montagnier showed they are able to organize nucleotides, the ingredients which actually make up DNA, into brand new DNA. Science has combined these ingredients countless times before, but in no experiment have they ever been able to recreate the spark of life and transform nucleotides into actual DNA, not without DNA already being present. Life after all can only exist where life has existed before. But in Luc Montagnier's experiments, the DNA had been completely filtered from the water. Yet new DNA was still formed. Just how was this possible? How had Luc Montagnier managed to achieve what no other scientist could and create life where no life was present? What was so different about Luc Montagnier's experiments? There was the presence of a frequency, a frequency which, when removed, would cause the experiments to fail, but when present, would ensure that they would succeed. That frequency was 7.83 Hertz, Schumann resonance. A delicate relationship had been struck between life and the frequency of the planet, an interaction of living organisms and electromagnetic frequencies, a reliance, a bond. Evidence of this can be found by reading the science papers, but more obvious proof can be found by simply walking outside. How did all this happen? Well, when you look at the history of the Earth, it seems pretty obvious. Human waves have been part of this planet since the very beginning. Life evolved surrounded by them and inevitably tuned in. In fact, our sensitivity to frequency became deeply connected to our ability to sense another of the planet's phenomena. Two billion years ago, magnotatic bacteria formed a simple but intriguing relationship with the Earth's magnetic fields. The single-celled organism contained particles of magnetic material. This enabled it to act like the needle of a compass and orient along the magnetic lines of the Earth. As organisms became more complex, so did their reliance on the Earth's magnetic fields.
We do know that bees are sensitive to magnetic fields. We know that within their bodies they contain particles of, of magnetite and laboratory studies have shown that they are indeed sensitive to magnetic fields and you can sh demonstrate in, a, in, in the laboratory that if you artificially create a magnetic field you can control the way that they build their comb and it seems logical that bees are using magnetic fields in navigation. The delicate balance of life on Earth is perfectly illustrated by reliance on bees and their pollination of plants. It's hypothesized that without bees, life wouldn't stand much of a chance. Insect pollination is needed for really all the things that make eating interesting. So all the fruits, the nuts uh, and uh, things like that all require insect pollination and bees are the most important group of pollinators. If the bees weren't here, if, if we, the bees, we'd have a very boring diet. Yes, we, we would have a very thin existence, I think that's the point, without bees. And of course, as well as the food that we need to eat, uh, they're pollinating wild plants as well. And in many cases, we don't know details about the pollination of, of wild plants, but we can be sure that without bees to pollinate them, many of our wild plants would disappear. Frazier, the Senior Extension Associate for Beekeeping at Pennsylvania State University. What are the classic criteria of colony collapse disorder so that any beekeeper can go out there and look at their bees and say, this looks like a pretty classic case of this? The symptoms are that the bees are relatively healthy and strong, and in a very short period of time, the adult bee population disappears from the colony, it leaves the colony. And what it leaves behind is a lot of brood, meaning the young bees, honey and pollen. On what continents has this uh, colony collapse disorder been observed? Well, the decline of honeybees has occurred actually um, worldwide. We've seen many other countries report declines in honeybees. Whether or not it's truly due to this thing called colony collapse disorder, which is a pretty unique set of uh, criteria, is another question. And that's one of the things we're trying to understand by trying to communicate with other people in other parts of the world. The sort of current concern particularly dates from about 2006 and particularly in the United States where a lot of commercial beekeepers suddenly found that their bees had been healthy at one point in the year and then in late summer just suffered these spectacular losses and, and they appeared to be different from anything that had been seen before so people were just going to their hives and finding there were no bees at all. Colony collapse disorder has affected hives all around the world with some countries reporting losses of up to 70%. A variety of reasons have been offered as to its cause, but none of them have been able to conclusively explain why all of a sudden bees don't return to their hives. Apart from one, a sensational piece of research by Joseph Kuhn and his team. In an experiment, the doctor worked with eight beehives and placed a regular home deck phone inside half of them. The scientists then monitored if the presence of a deck phone would affect the way that bees returned to their hive. The results were astonishing. In the hives where no deck phone was present, the bees returned at a normal rate. But in the hives which contained a deck phone, the bees hardly returned at all. In one hive containing a deck phone, not a single bee returned. To fully understand the relevance of Dr. Kun's experiment, we must first understand how a deck phone works. The reason you are able to walk around your home talking on your deck phone is because the base station of the deck phone sends electromagnetic frequency waves, called microwaves, to the handset. This is exactly the same way that a mobile phone mast 
communicate with a mobile phone. A deck phone is basically a miniature version of a mobile phone mast. If a beer is affected by what comes out of a deck phone, it will most definitely be affected by what comes out of a mobile phone mast. And with 4 billion mobile phone users around the world, all of a sudden, there are an awful lot of mobile phone masts. The bee's magnetic sense allows it to navigate using the magnetic lines of the Earth, an ability it has spent millions of years fine-tuning and developing. Does it stand to reason, then, that such an acute sensitivity would be affected by even the slightest change in the electromagnetic environment? So what about a gargantuan change, and one which has happened almost overnight? Are there other species that have this sensitivity to magnetic fields? A sensitivity which ultimately makes them vulnerable to man-made frequencies. Unfortunately, the discovery of a new protein cell called a cryptochrome suggests all life has a magnetic sense. They were discovered in the 1990s in plants where their function is to absorb blue light uh, which is used to regulate growth. They were since been found in insects, animals, mammals, including humans and in birds. Cryptochromes are a biological molecule called a protein. It's generated by some of your genes called trigenes and the cryptochrome molecule actually controls your circadian rhythms, including melatonin production. Some of the cryptochromes seem to have a function of absorbing light uh, as detectors for the circadian clock. So they are inputs for the light-dark cycle uh, that many species seem to have, um, plants as well as animals. But in the year 2000, Thorsten Ritz demonstrated an even more amazing role for the cryptochrome. In a series of experiments on robins, he demonstrated that their navigational sense was not only a magnetic one, but it came directly from the cryptochrome cells, which are located behind the eye. I think the Ritz paper published in 2000 is one of those milestones in science because he proposed that this cryptochrome molecule, which remember is best known for its effect in controlling circadian rhythms, that that molecule was actually responsible for giving the compass, magnetic compass information in birds. The birds literally see the Earth's magnetic field, perhaps as a bright or a dark spot superimposed on their field of vision. And as they then move their head or their body around, this spot moves, and so rather like a heads-up display for a fighter pilot, they have this thing that they see, goodness knows what it would be, uh, which allows them to orient uh, while they're flying. The way he tested that was to expose birds to radio frequency fields to see if it actually disturbed their magnetic compass. And not only did the radio frequency field indeed disrupt the um, migration of robins, but it did so at very, very low intensities of fields. And that, that's really important and really interesting, that very low level radio frequency fields interfered with, this, with, with the robin's compass. The experiments by Ritz clearly demonstrated that the cryptochrome cell used in navigation was seriously affected by man-made frequencies. And man-made frequencies at levels well below those deemed safe by the governing body, ICNRP. All of the animal navigation studies, the um, cockroaches, the zebra finches, the chickens, the robins, they've all had their magnetic compass disturbed 
by radio frequency fields well below the ICNERP public exposure limit. Like work on birds, particularly birds um, and insects, have shown that they are sensitive to fields way below the ICNERP levels that claim are safe for us. If you look at where, where the research shows they're sensitive to, there's good stuff in the literature showing it's significantly lower than what we're allowed to be exposed to and therefore what they're exposed to in the environment. There's certainly solid scientific reason for supposing that magnetic fields, artificial magnetic fields, will disturb the habitat of a number of species. How much has our environment changed because of electromagnetic fields? Because Over of the last 25 years, it's changed beyond recognition. Just beyond recognition. It's millions and millions of times in terms of electromagnetic energy. The former National Radiological Protection Board, uh, in their, one of their documents, said that they thought that the radiation environment, if you like to call it that, had increased many millions of times from what it was 50 years ago. Many millions of times. It's an enormous change in, yeah. in environment on Earth and it completely swamps all these natural signals, including the Schumann waves, that we have evolved with. One of the reasons that cryptochromes are particularly interesting from the point of view of human beings detecting magnetic fields is that there's a recently study by uh, Dr Foley and colleagues showing that if you put human cryptochromes into the fruit fly then the fruit fly is magnetically sensitive because of the presence of these human cryptochromes. So this is actually showing that human cryptochromes are magnetically sensitive, they actually detect magnetic fields. The discovery of the cryptochrome cell has sparked new interest in the magnetic sense of man, a sense that Robin Baker had predicted some 40 years ago. This is not some kind of scientific blind man's buff. It's an experiment to find out whether children have a sense of direction. Blindfolded and earmuffed, the subject is turned around in a special chair until he can't remember which direction he's facing. The chair stops and the subject guesses whether he's facing east, west, north or south. The guess is recorded in a small computer. If children had no sense of direction, their guesses would be random. But they're not. Children after the age of about 10 or 11 make pretty good guesses. It seems they have a real sense of direction, and it seems to be a magnetic sense. When the scientists strap a magnet to the subject's head, it disrupts his sense of direction severely. And this is a huge advance in understanding. It begs all sorts of questions. It begs questions as to whether human beings can actually navigate in the Earth's magnetic field. Even though they don't do it, don't do it today, did they do it thousands of years ago? And of course it begs the question, as to whether this is a process um, by which magnetic fields are actually detected in the human body which leads to this disturbance of circadian rhythms 
which would explain all these adverse health effects that we see so much of in the epidemiological studies of, of the health of magnetic fields. If mankind has the ability to sense magnetic fields, the same ability as the bees, the birds and the butterflies, does that also mean that we are as vulnerable as they are to man-made frequencies? Will changes in our environment affect us as it's clearly affecting them? Electrical sensitivity is when people start reacting, their body starts reacting to electromagnetic fields. Generally speaking, the electromagnetic fields that they'll be reacting to is wireless. So it'll be wireless communications, it'll be Wi-Fi, it'll be uh, cordless phones, deck phones, mobile phones, masts. All of them um, emitting signals uh, that our body has never experienced before. And when people start to become affected, when I became affected, the way that it starts to affect you is, generally speaking, it's your head first, and it will start giving you pains in your head, but I hate to use the word headache because it's, it's pains in your head that is unlike any other uh, headache you, you've ever had before. Most people's complaints um, are things like cardiac arrhythmia, um, insomnia, headache, visual disturbance, vertigo, um, different kinds of um, paresthesias or neurasthesias where they are feeling unusual sensations within their body. Uh, but really it can also affect endocrine function, thyroid function, um, again the list is really endless. In my particular case, and this is not everybody's case, if I then don't get out of the environment, I start getting quite uh, severe pains in my gut, and that will then mean uh, it's too late, and I, I will then start bleeding internally. I think that the symptoms are so diverse, and the associations that, um, that people make are, are very difficult to, to accept if you have no knowledge of this subject, which most physicians do not have and that's no fault of their own. We're not trained to recognise this condition. It's, it's very in innovative, and our understanding of it is entirely embryonic at this stage. We're at the very first steps of unravelling and fully understanding this condition. Brian, like many sufferers of electrosensitivity, has been forced to make radical changes to his home. Area, these two rooms have been completely shielded in metal foil so that this room and the bedroom are a Faraday cage. And if you actually check the electromagnetic fields or indeed the microwaves, and this, this machine is simply converting microwaves to noise, you find that the mass that is about half a mile away over there, which causes me a problem, by shielding the room and putting metallized glass, means that I can eliminate most of the electromagnetic fields. The aspects of an organism that allow it to detect and respond to electromagnetic fields, um, you could say, this word's going to use it in a number of different contexts, and if you bisect it and break it down, electrically sensitive, you could say that really that's a response to life itself. In that, for example, if, we, if we're looking at an organism to determine the presence of life, we're really looking for the presence of electricity. So with the electrocardiogram, for example, the ECG, and the electroencephalogram, the EEG, what we're looking at there is the presence of electricity from those target organs, the, the brain and the heart. And um, when we see the presence of that, that's a, that's a sign that there's life. So in a way, um, given that on a cellular level, electromagnetic fields are, are part of life itself, we could say that all life is electromagnetically sensitive. Desperate to convince people, 
that electrosensitivity was genuine. Brian and a number of other sufferers signed up to a landmark experiment at Essex University. The experiment, run by Elaine Fox, would sadly become the definitive work on the subject. You have to go into a shielded room and you go in there for a relatively short period of time and the mast is on for 10 minutes and off for 10 minutes and on for 10 minutes and to see whether you can detect whether it's on or not. And I went into the room having told them that I would not be able to tell them whether the mast was on or off or on. Why's that? Because their understanding of how you react to this is wrong. This is not a case with most people where you turn the mast on and, oh, I'm affected. They turn the mast off, oh, I'm okay again. It doesn't work like that. I, I suffer with hay fever. And when I go into a field where, where there's pollen, it takes a while before I'll be affected. But it takes a long time before I'm not affected. I can be removed from the hay field, field uh, for 24 hours, but I'll still be feeling my hay fever. And electrical sensitivity with most people is a little bit like that. The way the team had set up the experiment meant it would be almost impossible for Brian and the other volunteers to prove they were being affected. Not that it would matter, as the team had inexplicably decided to do away with any form of vetting procedure. For one thing, people appear to be sensitive to different things. I, I'm sensitive to 3G mobile phones, I'm sensitive to GSM mobile phones, for example. There are differences in the way the modulation works. I have no idea whether they're right in their sensitivities, but if that is the case, then it makes sense that the people who you've got into your study claim to be sensitive to exactly the signal that you're going to be exposing them to. If you have someone that, for example, is always sensitive to Wi-Fi, but they're never sensitive to mobile phones, if they exist, then you make sure that what they're being exposed to is Wi-Fi and not mobile phones because you're actually trying to prove whether they're sensitive to what they're saying they are. None of that differentiation was done. It was really if you claim to be sensitive to anything at all that happened to be electromagnetic, you were in. Well, one of the reasons why I thought it was quite important was I help people who are electrically sensitive. And a couple of months before, I'd actually been to uh, a lady's house uh, who thought she was electrically sensitive just to try and help her and to explain to her what electrical sensitivity was and what might be causing her problem. And to cut a long story short, it was obvious that this particular lady had a problem, but she was not electrically sensitive. She was definitely not electrically sensitive. But in the going of the conversation, she'd signed up for the Essex trials to try and find out whether she was electrically sensitive. Well, my heart missed a beat. Well, here's somebody that's not electrically sensitive and they've signed up to go to Essex and Essex are telling me they don't have a vetting procedure. What they actually found, and this is based on the text in the paper itself, I'm not sort of paraphrasing, is they needed, according to them, with the level of response they were expecting to see from sensitive people, they would need about 132 people, participants in their study, to show a statistically significant effect. That's how much population, if you like, they would need. That's how much data they would need in their study findings before they could say this group is clearly more sensitive than that group. What they got was 44. So from the very outset they only had the third, a third of the data they expected that they would need to find anything anyway. What they ended up finding was a near statistically significant risk anyway, i.e. the people who claimed to be sensitive showed that they were sensitive with a significance of about 90%. So the borderline at which a scientific paper says, yes, this is statistically significant, is 95%. If you don't get that level of certainty, it's not a statistical finding at all. It could be random chance and noise. They got something which was 90% certainty of an increase in risk. And of course, it, it fails the magic bar at which you can call it a statistically significant result. And it was written off as a, this demonstrates that people aren't sensitive, when actually it did no such thing. The constant exposure to the mast took its toll on a number of the volunteers, making some of them so sick they were forced to withdraw from the experiment. For Brian, the effects of the experiment would be felt long after he left Essex. I've had uh, my first colonoscopy was seven years ago, my second one was four years ago, my third one was about a year ago. There's nothing the matter with me, there's nothing the matter with me. Absolutely, you know, you're imagining it. I've got colon cancer. 
So from the first time that I bled to the time of removing the polyp was seven years. When I asked the doctor how long does it take to this, to cancer to develop, seven years. So you can virtually track the time when I went to Essex and there was one occasion before where I started bleeding with that bleeding has caused me colon cancer. How could such a botched experiment be held up as such a definitive piece of research? Why would such an experienced team make such fundamental and obvious errors in their work? Could it be anything to do with those who provided the funding? The Essex experiment is one of a number of experiments funded by the MTHR, a company set up and funded by the mobile industry themselves. Could you explain what MTHR does and how MTHR is funded? Yes, the, the MTHR programme is funded jointly by the UK government and the mobile telecommunications industry and it funds research into possible adverse health effects related to mobile phone technology. The whole issue of who funds scientific research is a thorny issue. Um, I, I know many scientists like myself who, when they get a new study to read, the first thing they turn to is the back of the page where it says who funded it. Is there, do you think, a, maybe a conflict of interest in the mobile phone industry funding research into the harm that it does? Well, of course there is a, a, a potential conflict of interest and that's why a, a programme of funding like this has to be carefully managed. I've done a lot of work with the telecommunications industry because I, I happen to have a, I, I organise the communication workers uh, representation in here and so I've talked to these people for a long time. I think they would like to be objective but they are driven, particularly in a market where they're fighting each other for market share by, by profit and therefore they, they may fund research but much like the, like the pharmaceutical industry you often find that they're hiring people who've already spoken on, on their side of the argument. Scientists aren't pop stars, they don't earn a lot of money, they have houses to finance, they have families to look after. Who can blame them for recognising that if they find the wrong results, they're not going to get another job from that source at any rate? There are psychological pressures, even in the absence of actual pressures, which may or may not be present in individual circumstances. There are clearly psychological pressures to conform uh, and, and to please the organisation providing your funding. You feel obliged. You feel obliged, you feel obliged. There are some really solid statistics showing that uh, where uh, uh, there is an issue over electromagnetic field effects, that the studies funded by the utilities or by the power industry or the radio industry or by the uh, mobile phone industry um, are uh, funded by them, that the studies tend to be significantly negative, whereas the studies funded independently within universities and so on tend not to be so. It's a challenging area in which to research. It's not easy to do studies of that sort. And um, because of the constraints of doing research in human subjects, you're not going to have perfect research studies. There are always going to be limitations. Is this a real condition? Yes, absolutely it is. At present, the World Health Organization statements regarding this are that it is real and symptoms can be severe and, and disabling. Figures for electromagnetic hypersensitivity are around 2 to 3 percent. Those are people who've had their life extremely affected by this condition. But, as I've previously mentioned, on a cellular level, 100 percent of people are, are reacting. That means that the, the healthcare consequences of, of not taking this seriously and not recognising it are potentially huge. And the numbers of people that have mild or moderate electrical sensitivity are probably far higher than we estimate.
will that leave us? It leaves us with a tape recording of an experimental link-up between a standard telephone and a unique mobile handset. A dialing tone. And that's quite an achievement because it's one thing to transmit a conversation. It's another to transmit accurate digital information. Now, an extension at the Research Institute in Chelmsford, which has perfected this technique. On the other end of this should be Liz Charnock. With the advent of the mobile phone in the 1980s came the need to build a network of antennas to support them. Since then, the telecom companies have erected over 5 million mobile phone masts around the world. But incredibly, prior to filling the air with microwave frequencies, they didn't conduct a single piece of research to ensure there wouldn't be any long-term health effects from such exposure. The grid was built without first making sure it was safe. Thank you for your help. So, it's pretty ugly, isn't it? Yeah, and it's constant as well. One thing you'll notice is it doesn't stop. It's 24-7, mm. this is what's coming out of the mast. If you can see the mast, you're being exposed to it. Right. Frankly, even if you can't, you're being exposed to it if you're this distance away because it'll pass through you know, concrete walls and things. It'll dampen it a bit, but not very much. If you're within two, 300 metres of the mast up there, this is what you're going to be exposed to 24-7. When you can hear it, it changes everything. It does. Imagine yeah. if you could see it. It'd be the equivalent of sort of, you know, seeing a daily smog. Yeah. With a constant smog of man-made frequencies surrounding our daily lives, and no testing as to its safety, is there any wonder people's bodies have started to react? Well, it was um, almost 10 years ago and I was in my 30s. No history of breast cancer in my family and living a really healthy lifestyle. I'd been living next to a foam mast for um, many years, over seven years by then. How far was that from? It was 100 metres from the house. Right, so pretty close. Yeah, and for years I'd been having symptoms which hadn't related to the foam mast because I, I didn't know anything about you know, the condition of electrosensitivity then and I'd been having vertigo, sleep problems, headaches, sharp pains in my head. And I'd often visit the doctor only to be told it was either stress or a virus. And then, just out of the blue, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And it was the biggest shock of my life. And, I, and I, at first I thought, well, it's bad luck, you know, it's just unlucky, it's me. And um, started to go through my treatment. And it was then I started bumping into neighbours in the hospital. And I only lived in a small village. Right. And started bumping into other young ladies as well, f who were neighbours. Young? Who, how old are you? Oh, well, I, I was the youngest in my 30s, but right. the others were in their 40s or early 50s. Right. So it's very young. And that was five of us all, all diagnosed at once, um, within six months of each other, with breast cancer. There were only 18 houses in the village surrounding the foam mast. So Eileen decided to conduct a survey to see if anybody else had suddenly started suffering ill health. What came back really frightened us. We, lots of people were reporting the same symptoms that I've been suffering with for years. So the health, vertigo. Yeah, the headaches, the headaches. vertigo. But there was other young women in the village who were having fertility problems and pre-cancer cervical cells, other um, young ladies who'd had breast, breast cancer benign, well, benign lumps, and there were other conditions of cancer as well in the area. One of our neighbours, who was only 51, had developed motor neurone disease and he, he unfortunately died. And so we, we unearthed a, a horrendous can of worms. We've done a count of 77 people in the houses. And out of 77 um, people, how many people the, were suffering the, biological effects? The, uh, the estimate was um, around 70%. 70% of people who'd had effects over the years for, with biological effects, sleep problems, skin rashes, benign lumps, lumps or cancer. Um, yeah, it was a, a, a big, it had a big impact on people in the village. 
I think this, this is a global massive problem. We yeah. found since then that we were not the only cancer cluster around a foam mast. There are many cancer clusters around foam masts. And we'd worked with a local scientist where we looked at other foam masts that have been in areas for a long time and conducted other surveys and found other cancer clusters as well. With so many phones and masts, and a mobile phone industry worth trillions, you would hope that by now, a strict governing body would have been installed. An iron-fisted regulator, who ensures the telecoms industry airs on the side of caution. Someone to set strict levels which protect the public. Someone to ensure that what we're being exposed to is absolutely safe. Unfortunately, we don't have any of that. What we do have is ICNUP. Well, ICNUP was set up in Europe about 20 odd years ago to look into um, non-ionising radiation. It stands for the International Committee of Non-ionising Radiation Protection and their job is to look at all the literature that comes out and basically summarise it, say this is what the science definitely says. You can't get elected to it, you get invited to... To, to join it right. if you're one of the, the preferred people. Right, got so you. it's always erred on the side of industry because that's really where its roots are. So what we've got is we've got a guidance standard which they've set, which has been adopted by most of the countries in um, Europe and it's been something that the European Commission themselves recommend, including their expert body, Senir. But those guidelines are based on evidence that we know has a cause and effect for radio frequency radiation. So the only setting that exists at the moment for energy that's around the same frequency of mobile phone masts, mobile phones, debt cordless phones, wireless communication devices that we're used to on a daily basis is the one that we know works for microwave ovens, i.e. if you generate enough energy and localise it in a small enough area, you heat things. You heat tissue, you heat anything that has some level of water in it. None of the current rules of anything to do with chronic health effects or cancer. None of them, not one of them. They're all set for heating effects and uh, acute effects like prickling of the skin or your eyebrows going up or something like that, you know. None of them are for long-term health effects. So saying that it's below 40, that means it's nothing, it's meaningless. It's meaningless. It is not intended to protect from long-term health effects. ICNIRP is, well, ICNIRP is just irrelevant. It's, it's irrelevant. Well, for example, if you want to make sure that nobody exceeds the speed limit past a school, set the speed limit at a thousand miles an hour. Then everyone will obey the speed limit. No one will exceed it. You know, everyone can go sailing past this school at 999 miles an hour uh, and the limit will be uh, uh, complied with. The advisory body effectively are not set up to look at the evidence with regards to safeguarding the general public. So it, 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 you know, essentially there to establish what's 100% facts and anything that's not 100% facts is not their concern. That's right. They'll, they'll talk about it, they'll summarise what there is, what there isn't and what's left to find out and then that's it. They'll leave it there. No recommendations, nothing, because they just don't see it as their job. Try and make a call. Let me try and make a if call. If you try and make a phone call, it'll be almost constant because it starts right. a proper sort of two way high bandwidth transmission. Okay, let's do that. Oh, wow. So as soon as it picks up, this is it trying to. And this is once it's on call mode, this is now what the phone's doing. And that's waves going yeah. from my phone to the base station and then being transmitted from yeah. there. And that's it's picked up. That's horrible. And that's basically what your phone's transmitting into your head all the time that you've, you've, you've got it operation and you're using it for phone. It's hard to imagine a piece of technology which has accelerated into our lives quite like the mobile phone. 25 years ago, it was seen as little more than a gimmick. Today, 
four billion of his own one. And the average age of a child when they receive their first phone is just eight years old. The way a mobile phone works is by sending and receiving microwave frequencies to and from the base station. So having a phone pressed against your head inevitably means your brain is being exposed to those waves. Does the brain react to this exposure? A recent American study shows it absolutely does. The work was carried out by Dr. Nora Valco. Dr. Valco and her team studied 47 healthy people for an entire year. Participants had a cell phone placed on their left and right ears. One was activated but muted, the other was turned off. Dr. Valco used brain imaging equipment to study how much glucose the brain would use during exposure. So it's a very sensitive marker to indicate if there are changes in brain activity that may be driven by a given stimulus, which in this case was the cell phone. When the brain is stimulated, it consumes glucose in the same way a car consumes fuel. 15 minute exposure to a cell phone was associated with increases in glucose consumption by the brain, which indicates that the brain was being activated by the radio frequencies from the cell phone. This right area of the brain that was very close to the antenna showed the largest increases in metabolism as compared when the telephones were off. Even though the radio frequencies that are emitted from current cell phone technologies are very weak, they are able to activate the human brain to have an effect. By using a muted cell phone, Dr. Valco's experiment showed that the human brain has a metabolic reaction to the presence of microwaves from a mobile phone. A metabolic reaction at levels well below the legal limit. Something many people claimed was impossible. And the reaction recorded by the doctor is secondary to an even greater concern. The way that those microwaves are actually absorbed by the brain. This has become known as SAR. SAR is, well first of all it stands for Specific Absorption Rate and uh, that's the, the measure of how much radio waves or how much RF energy, in this case radio waves, is absorbed into the human body over a certain period of time within a certain volume. So it's a measure of the, the heating effect that a radio transmitter would have on your, on your body, on the human body. The SAR for every mobile phone is measured in this way, using an artificial head called a SAM Phantom. This is filled with a glucose mixture which represents the brain. The probe measures the amount of microwave radiation that penetrates the SAM Phantom skull and calculates the SAR rating based on how much energy is absorbed. For the European Union, the limit is two watts per kilogram, um, over a 10 gram average of, of tissue. Um, for America, it's 1.6 watts per kilogram, over a one gram average of uh, tissue. So the limit for the USA is more stringent than for the European Union, but other countries around the world, such as Australia, New Zealand, use the European limit. Some of the most popular phones on the market emit so much microwave radiation that their SAR rating is right on the edge of the limit. Every millimetre of skull helps protect the brain against the phone's microwave radiation and therefore lowers the phone's SAR rating. Children get their first phone at the average age of eight years old. An eight-year-old skull is considerably thinner than that of an adult. So you would hope that phones are tested against a skull which represents the thickness of that of a child. The SAM head is an average shaped and sized human skull. 
The average of 10,000 people have, has been taken in terms of the head measurements and this SAM phantom head has been created, which is an average human, human skull. Obviously the head of an average human being is considerably larger than that of an eight-year-old child. But when we investigate the company that makes the SAM phantom head, we discover that the news is even worse. The SAM Phantom isn't just the average of 10,000 people. It's the average of 10,000 US Army personnel. And US Army personnel most certainly have a larger, bigger, thicker head than the average eight-year-old. It's pretty reasonable to assume that if most mobile phones were tested against the skull of an eight-year-old, they would fail. Who is it that sets the standards? Um, a group of um, people called, uh, from a committee called ICNERP. The people who do the work on mobile phones are by and large engineers. They have no idea what is going on inside the living cell, but they are pontificating uh, on this. They make the assumption that the only thing that can affect um, the well-being of a living organism is if it is powerful enough to heat the tissue. But that's like saying, uh, we know if we boil an egg, it goes hard. What they don't know is that if they don't boil the egg, it turns into a chicken. And they haven't the slightest idea how that happens, but yet they pontificate as if they do. In 2011, the World Health Organization changed the danger rating of mobile phones, reclassing it as possibly carcinogenic to humans. Based on an increased risk of contracting a geloma, the type of brain tumour associated with using a mobile phone. What was the catalyst for this abrupt change in status? There have been countless studies conducted into the possible health effects of mobile phones. Some showing an effect, some showing no effect. But the most conclusive came from Leonard Hardell. He has overseen the largest and most comprehensive piece of research ever conducted, combining his own work with that of others from around the world. From the early 1990s, they have investigated the phone habits of more than 2,000 people from around the world. People with tumours such as astrocytoma and acoustic neuroma. The brain tumours associated most with mobile phone use due to their proximity to the ear. Their findings are shocking. They concluded that mobile phone use does increase the risk of a brain tumour. And they also discovered why earlier research showed no effect. I think there's more evidence that it's carcinogenic than just possibly carcinogenic. But I can understand it in a way because um, most of the cancers which will arrive haven't arrived yet. I mean, people haven't been using cell phones for long enough for the true effect to become apparent. As is the case with other carcinogens, it takes at least 10 years before you start to see an effect from the exposure. Because the mobile phone explosion didn't really take hold until the late 1990s, it's not surprising we are just starting to see the effects right now. So what are the telecoms industry doing to protect its users from contracting a brain tumour? A flick to the far reaches of their safety manuals 
suggests that they are more concerned about protecting themselves. At the back of almost every single phone's user guide are instructions on how far to keep your phone from your body. Instructions which, in the most part, are wholly unworkable. And what happens when the telecoms industry funds research into the harm that they are causing And that research concludes that there is an effect. That the use of a mobile phone does play a role in the development of cancer. They tend to keep that research to themselves. We just don't know what we're storing up with EMF because um, the effects are largely long-term and we have, as you say, this ubiquitous exposure and ubiquitous uh, um, reliance on these exposures. We just, we just don't fully understand yet what we're doing. Although the epidemiology clearly shows that using a mobile phone increases the risk of contracting a brain tumour, what people like Ichnerp need to see is a definitive cause and effect. How it happens. What's the mechanism? How exactly is the cancer caused? It may seem obvious that a being so tuned in to the Earth's frequencies and so sensitive to her magnetic fields would naturally have a reaction to man-made microwaves. But for years, the telecoms industry have defended their actions by asking the same question. As it turns out, they've been asking the wrong question. The answer is melatonin. You know, melatonin is a hormone, and believe it or not, it's made in the brain. It's made in the pineal gland of the brain and it's got a very powerful antioxidant status compared with vitamins. For example, uh, melatonin is five times as powerful as vitamin C and twice as powerful as vitamin E. And it secretes only at night and it's at night that we need it because that's when we go to sleep and when our brain repairs the cells of our body. And that's when melatonin comes out to do its work. Each day, our body loses about half a billion cells. And at night, that's when our body replaces those cells. Through a process called cell mitosis, the dividing of cells. And what it's doing is it's mopping up what are called free radicals. These free radicals are really the spare electrons left over from the process of making the energy which we need to repair ourselves in the first place. Each night, as our body repairs itself, millions of free radical cells are created as a byproduct of cell mitosis. These free radical cells attack healthy cells. It is universally agreed that the free radical cell is the main causal factor in most cancer. Our body's main defense against these free radicals is its most powerful antioxidant, melatonin. It passes into the bloodstream 
and its job is to act as a natural antioxidant, a natural anti-cancer agent. Melatonin is a very, very powerful uh, anti-cancer agent. What it does is it, it acts as a, 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 what's called an oncostatic agent, that, that is it protects you against cancer. Um, it controls the sleep-wake cycle so that you get a good night's sleep when you've got proper melatonin. It's an anti-aging uh, molecule. In other words, it, by mopping up those free radicals, it leaves your skin and complexion uh, looking younger. We have in our lab 12,000 studies which we've uh, collected over the years. And that is more studies than have ever been published on paracetamol, which is the most common uh, uh, headache reliever. Um, more there's more scientific interest in melatonin than there is uh, in paracetamol. What are the consequences of having a reduced amount of melatonin? Yeah. Well, you have a reduced amount of melatonin, and what happens then is that your immune system starts to be less competent for a start. You tend to get sleep disturbance, you can't get off to sleep, or if you do, you wake up and can't get back to sleep. Um, you can have uh, heart complications because uh, melatonin protects your heart as well. and um, you're much more prone to disease because your immune system is uh, not functioning at its best. So these are some of the things that happen when you have a lowered melatonin level. And for example, the average um, woman with breast cancer has only got one-tenth of the melatonin of a normal woman of her age. And for people with prostate cancer, they've got less than half the melatonin that uh, they should have. Autistic children have less than half the melatonin levels that they should enjoy. Reduce melatonin in night shift workers because they're working at night and exposed to light, they don't produce nocturnal melatonin, um, is known to produce a 50% increase in breast cancer risk. And the International Agency for Research on Cancer, IARC, has actually classed uh, night shift work as a class 2A probable carcinogen because of this melatonin uh, reduction. There are lots of studies now showing that people on, on night shifts or people who are blind have different cancer rates than uh, the average population and, and most of those studies support the view that the absence or the uh, lowered melatonin has an adverse effect on health because the body only repairs itself at night. Melatonin is only produced when the pineal gland senses that no light is present. What happens is that the pineal gland is light sensitive. It's sitting right where your brain uh, receives signals from your eyes at crossover point in the middle. It's called the suprachiasmatic nuclei. And the, the, the connections from there goes directly to the pineal gland to tell it whether it's, there's any light around or not. If there's light around, then there's also interference with the signals the brain wants to sell, send to, to our cells in order to repair them. So it says there's no point in the brain sending these signals out to our cells to tell them to repair because there's so much interference that they won't hear it. So it waits, the brain waits until it's dark. research has shown that there's an effect on melatonin production from electric fields, magnetic fields, radio waves? Right, well, the, the, the Battelle Institute in America uh, has done a lot of work on this way back from the uh, late 1970s, in fact. Um, and their uh, scientists there, Barry Wilson and Dick Stevens and people like that, started thinking that because we know that if you turn the light on, then the brain stops making melatonin, they thought, well, maybe our brains can't distinguish between electric fields and, uh, that we make ourselves artificially or, and the natural light that we all know 
is happens during the daytime because we just don't make melatonin in the daytime. Um, for very good biological reasons. So they thought, well, maybe these electric fields are suppressing the synthesis of melatonin and that that in turn is leading to cancer, breast cancer particularly, in women because they don't have the immunological protection that they would otherwise have. So the brain interprets radio waves as being light waves? Yeah, we don't know the difference. The hypothesis that the pineal gland cannot distinguish between light frequencies and man-made frequencies is certainly backed up by a wealth of research. Do you think it's pretty conclusive that electric fields, magnetic fields, radio waves affect the production of melatonin? This research which shows that uh, kestrel melatonin levels fall with exposure, that white storks nesting on buildings near to radio masts have lowered progeny compared with uh, stork nests a long way away from radio masts, studies on ants, studies on bees, and studies on birds of various kinds, studies on marine mammals, all point in the same direction. But then there are studies in the laboratory of cells in the pineal gland, which actually synthesizes the melatonin, and looking at the effects of magnetic fields on those cells. And at virtually every stage in the synthesis of melatonin, it's been shown that magnetic fields disturbs the actual production uh, of um, of melatonin. So you see the evidence is in all aspects of the pathway of um, melatonin production, that the in inhibition of melatonin production by magnetic fields, the research covers really every aspect of that pathway. Would you say that it's, it's almost conclusive? Yes, I would say, I would say it is almost conclusive. The genius of our body means it is able to counter the production of free radicals with the production of melatonin. We have created in ourselves a precise balance, a perfect system of defense. It has taken our body millions of years to perfect this technique, a technique created based on the surroundings we have evolved in. But over the last few decades, our surroundings have changed and changed exponentially. To the naked eye, the world appears to be the same. But at a cellular level, it is the biggest change in environment life has ever encountered. It stands to reason that such a gargantuan change would inevitably upset such a delicate balance. And the consequences of our bodies not producing the right amount of melatonin could be disastrous. Scientists around the world now believe that free radicals could be the causal factor in every known disease, not just cancer. In the beginning of the 1900s, uh, childhood leukaemia was a medical rarity. 
We've seen nothing but an increase in, in childhood leukemia ever since that point. It's going up every year by about 2%. And that applies to many other disorders as well. Uh, autism, brain tumors, cancer. Cancer rates in the 1910s were, were probably half of what they are today. Um, and many other diseases are being uh, connected by studies, by scientific studies, with exposure to, bio, to electromagnetic fields and radiations. Uh, not just power lines, but also to radio fields and microwave fields. Because we've, we've, we've start, we've, in the last 50 years, really, we've, we've immersed ourselves in an ocean of electromagnetic radiation. It's all around us now. Invisible, we can't see it, but we know it's there. Every time you lift up your mobile phone, you know it's there. It's, it's very, very hard to turn the clock back, or if not impossible to turn the clock back. But we need to be aware of the adverse health effects so that we have the choice of taking precaution against the exposures. If that's what we wish to do, that's what we need to do. What worries me are things that are actually happening now. Right. That we haven't paid enough attention to, perhaps. And one of the things that's happening is autism, or give it its proper name, autistic spectrum disorders. Do you think we're getting to a point in science where we almost don't have a control group to be able to test things like this because almost everybody has a mobile phone, almost everybody has Wi-Fi, almost everybody is exposed to electromagnetic fields. Yes, we are reaching a situation where so many people are exposed to electromagnetic fields from mobile phones and Wi-Fi that we no longer have a control population to look at, expo uh, at the difference between people, the health of people who are exposed versus the health of people who are not exposed. I mean, if I can take an analogy, we did find out that smoking caused lung cancer. That was because some people did not smoke and they were a control group. If everyone had smoked, we may never have found that smoking caused lung cancer. And everyone would have been dying of lung cancer and it would have been regarded as a sort of natural disease without ever having a link with smoking. What's happening with mobile phone exposure is we are losing this population of people who are not exposed. Even the few people who don't own a mobile phone are surrounded by the radiation from the mobile phone when they go shopping, when they go on a train, wherever they go. It's not just the, the, the canary down the mine like myself. Eventually, if you, if you simply increase the electromagnetic fields in the, in the atmosphere, which we're doing, and we've now got a million times, a million times more electromagnetic fields, microwaves in the environment than we had 30 years ago, eventually it'll start to affect you. It's very, very hard to say where we might be in 15 years' time, but I would very much hope that in a few years' time we do recognise just how much these ill health effects are actually costing society. And then we might wake up and look at the causes and realise we have to do something about the causes. We are a brilliant yet complex organism. The way that our body functions isn't by chance, nor is it something which has happened overnight. Like every other creature on this planet, we have adapted into the environment we exist in. An environment which, since the beginning of time, has had a delicate balance of fields and resonances. These phenomena don't just surround us, they make us what we are. The cells of our body communicate with each other using light frequencies. Our DNA uses electromagnetic frequencies to reproduce itself. At the core of everything are protons and electrons, positive and negative, making all life magnetic. We are, as all life is, equipped with cryptochrome cells which allows us to sense those fields in ways we barely understand. We are beings of frequency, electricity, light, 
and magnetism. And to become this way has taken millions of years, a process which started with the very first cell. Although we have embraced the wireless technology and accepted it into our everyday lives, at a cellular level, our bodies haven't. The frequencies that now surround us are as alien to our cells as they would be to our eyes, if only we could see them. Our children are being born into a world that their bodies simply cannot understand. Where will all this lead? As this film is being made, 4G technology is being rolled out around the world. To accommodate this, the ceiling levels are being increased. Wi-Fi is in almost every single home, school and business, surrounding us constantly. Deck phone technology is the norm in almost every single household. At a time when the industry is responsible should be displaying caution, they are displaying a reckless disregard for our long-term health. Money talks. And they are about as likely to develop a conscience as the tobacco industries did. If there's going to be a change, it's not going to come from them. It's going to have to come from us. We just need to open our eyes and see the problem. With the MTHR, do you think uh, fund research into uh, radio waves affecting melatonin, given that this is the mechanism that people seem to point to, that um, mobile phones affect the production of melatonin? Melatonin is a, an antioxidant, a free radical vacuum cleaner, if you like. When we issue a call for research proposals, as we're doing, at the moment, while we highlight areas that are of particular interest, we invite applications, proposals across the spectrum. But it, it, you know, it would have, would have to be prioritised alongside the other applications that we get. We only have a limited pot of money. But, but we don't rule out funding research on melatonin. It's not one of the areas that we've, we've identified as a priority at the moment.